Evening all. Hi all. I thought this week uh, we could take a break from Tal or Sparoff or other mega mega famous players, but I'll look at a recent event, the Hastings Chess Congress, a very long established congress going back even to the 1800s. There was a tournament in 1895, I think. Um, very early congress, massive history to it. And um, it was split into a summer component uh, for the international events, and that's only held occasionally, and also a yearly uh, event from December, January. So they overlap into the new year. So in the most recent Hastings Congress, British Grandmaster Gwen Jones played exceptionally great games and managed to overcome many Grandmasters and get a near 2700 FIDE rating performance. I thought this week we could have a look at some of his key wins along the way. So um, he got a lot of experience in the recent London Classic to work with playing against the world's elite as well. So how well did he fare in these games? In round one I believe he was playing FIDE Master David Hayden 23-1-5. So David's actually a very, very strong, uh, naturally talented player who's done very well himself in Hastings in recent years, beating one year, uh, you, you, for example, Ivanka Huska, one of the strongest female players in the country. Uh, he's got a very, very solid style and a great fan of the Slav defence with the black pieces. Uh, so let's let's have a look at that game first. So Gwen Jones played d4, and we saw the Slav defence c6 being played. Okay. So it's also at the moment why it can go into the Karakhan uh, with e4, but uh, c4 going into Slav defence territory. So d5 a solid reliable opening matching david david style of chess knight c3 knight f6 the e3 e6 so restricting the bishop semi slav uh restricts the bishop very solid difficult to crack uh position okay so here gwen jones plays the move knight f3 so already, by the way, after e6, well, in this position here, e3 is a quiet continuation, but white has actually a simple plan with this system. He's protecting simply the pawn on c4, avoiding any complicated gambits. And white's simple plan is usually, and I think this was played way back in the Campablanca era, that white aims to just play for e4 quickly later to liberate this bishop, which is at the moment in the pawn chain. So very, very simple chess here from white to react in this position with e3. So e6, and we see the move knight f3. So white is politely putting pressure onto the dark squares here. Knight bd7, and now bishop d3. And black responds with bishop d6, as though black might be interested in the future in, in e5. And that's usually done with d takes c4 first, then an e5 to liberate this bishop. So both sides are keen to get nice pieces from the resulting pawn structures, pieces that are in harmony with the pawn structure. And the typical break for both sides in this structure is e4. But for black, it's usually taking first on c4 and then e5. But here, white does not routinely uh, castle, uh, which you might find surprising, but um, Black doesn't have to routinely castle. Maybe black possibly can play d takes here and play e5. Uh, possibly, but it looks a little bit dangerous. Um, that might not be the case, but uh, white didn't routinely castle. We know that for a fact here that white was very keen to create this e4 break rapidly in this position, uh, not even castling. So e4 straight away, and this might strike you as slightly unusual. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, just want to maximize one of my uh, chat windows one moment on Twitch, just in case uh, 
OK. So here e4 is played. So black uh, is now faced with e5. Uh, so if he, if he wants, he can take on c4, I guess. Uh, but black actually took on e4. And quite a curious uh, set of forcing moves here, which take a lot of pieces off because the white king's still in the center. So black has an idea, maybe against Garwin Jones, who's 2644 Fide, and David's 2315. Maybe he's thinking he can use forcing moves to really get the pieces off here, and the fact that the king is still in the center in this position. So what he does, he takes, uh, after takes, he takes on e4. Then he plays knight f6, another forcing move. The bishop goes back, and a very, very forcing move. And you might be surprised by this. It's queen a5 check. And it's not with an aggressive, crude intention. And I'm not entirely sure it will be completely and utterly terrible uh, in this position. White plays bishop d2. But uh, let me ask you, how many of you would consider being cheeky against Garwin Jones and playing Queen H5 here? Or do you think it's pointless? Um, in the game, Bishop B4 was played, but if I let you examine this position for 20 seconds, do you think Queen H5 is really, really bad uh, compared to Bishop B4? Or do you think Black maybe has misplayed this already? What do you think is going on here? Any thoughts at this point? Anyone? Queen H5? Is it bad? <clears throat> okay, well, if if we imagine Queen H5 was played, you know, maybe White White doesn't have to castle kingside. Uh, White has got E5 under control anyway, so maybe castling kingside isn't isn't bad. There's no threat, maybe. Maybe just White plays Queen E2 though, and just eyes E5 just to stop E5, and then can consider castling queenside, H3 and G4 ready-made attack if Black castles kingside. Possibly that that's a plan here as well. Why doesn't have to castle kingside? If black dead castle here, then maybe we've got a nice attacking position to work with. Maybe even g4 might be on the cards here. So, okay, so David's move is bishop d2. Sorry, after bishop d2, pardon me, David's move is bishop b4. Bishop b4. And, okay, um, black is getting rid of the dark square bishops. Okay, we know that in the Slav we've got usually dark square weaknesses. These these weaknesses in particular, and you can imagine d6 being potentially useful or e5. This dark square complex is going to be slightly weakened with the exchange of dark square bishops, and you might not think that's entirely critical, or is it? Because also we've got another issue: a hemmed in bishop here on on c8. Can these factors really lead to a significant advantage for white after the exchange of dark square bishops? Um, for those just, just getting to this game, this is the, in the recent Hastings tournaments, Garwin Jones, a very strong British grandmaster, did very well. So we're looking at his first round game against David Hayden, who's an FM. So David playing black has achieved a position in the Slav defence, playing slightly unusually where he's getting rid of the dark square bishops. So bishop takes d2, white doesn't want a queen exchange, he keeps the queens on, knight takes d2. So some complexity, complexity held in the position. Black canal castles and we see queen e2 which keeps a lock and key pardon me, over e5 at the moment. And this bishop still hemmed in. We see queen c7. And now the move rook fd1. You might think that's not entirely routine here. 
surely why not for example rook f e1 well maybe the d pawn's a bit loose here it is a semi open file okay black plays b6 but another point is revealed behind rook d1 that actually it's x-raying that sensitive d6 square and how can white exploit d6 white plays queen e5 in this position offering an exchange of queens now because that would be really stamping out the d6 square if that was taken uh, so let, let's imagine black did take we take knight g4 okay maybe knight f3 and we've got nice access to d6 with that rook so perhaps black thought this isn't too hot um, and if the bishop moves of course rook d7 as well as an infiltration point so in this position the exchange of queens uh, was avoided with queen e7 yes uh, Bikurka, um yes white is playing against the bad white bishop on c8 yes so it's quite clear cut strategically here knight e4 now threatening uh maybe either to double the pawns or knight d6 but we see now there's more interest in playing knight d6 here playing against this bishop as mentioned rook fd8 and now the bishop is hemmed in with c5 locking the bishop in but giving up the d5 square and now this knight is not entirely uh without um a problem because knight e8 questions you know should should the knight really have to take on e8 here perhaps there isn't much um, uh, great choices here okay because well if the knight retreats maybe this this isn't so hot because of possibly uh, rook rook d5 but anyway in this position white decided to take on e8 and all this simplification you might ask does right white really have a potentially win advantage has black really kind of got something to work here into a win um so let's see what happens rook ac1 rook ad8 using that semi open file that that backward pawn it's technically a backward pawn so bishop e4 prevents uh rook d5 and puts potential pressure on c6 maybe white is now threatening taking on b6 to take c6 f6 kicking the queen Queen goes to h5 another threat for black to deal with we see f5 being used to defend h7 weakening a bit for the moment these these key dark squares well e5 in particular bishop drops back and this is quite interesting that the bishop goes here as as though c5 is loose here but uh there'll be a backfire surely Black is not interested in taking on c5 uh, in this position, it seems. Uh, let's, let's have a quick look at that. So if black was greedy, takes, takes. Now black has two options, maybe. Rook takes or queen takes. So is this terrible? Possibly um, it is terrible, but let's let's see exactly why. Because actually, I've noticed something quite horrendous for Black uh, potentially in this position. What can White play here? And I've just noticed this myself. Uh, if I give you twenty seconds, can you see an interesting tactical resource in this position? So twenty seconds starting from now. I'm, I haven't engine checked this game. I've just spotted a tactical resource myself. I'm not entirely sure if it's brilliant, but can you see what resource I've just spotted in this position? So white's play here. What what could you play here with white? Anyone?
Yes. Yes. Congrats. Someone on play chess. I don't know. If, <laughs> I, I think that rook d7 here is pretty powerful. It threatens queen f7 mating. If takes, then there's a weakness of the last move, and Black's dropping the rook. So I think rook d6 is pretty. Rook d7 is pretty drastic. Uh, cruncher. And honestly, I just spotted that just now. I was just thinking, this pawn on c5. What's the idea? They don't just leave pawns on to be taken. Surely it's, it's not like casual. There's nothing. And also, there's ob obviously there's an option for Black in this position to take on d1 as well. If what if black takes on d1 what what should white play here maybe it's the same thing white's got time for rook d7 here same thing maybe or rook f8 you know black is on c2 maybe this is not it possibly it's not unless well we've got time for an attacking move in this position i think with the queen away from the defense actually i've spotted something here which might be interesting but then again I'm not entirely yes I think I am entirely sure I think there is a crunching continuation here for white can you spot this one I think I've seen a crunching continuation now if I give you 20 seconds what would you play here with white right right reaper i don't know if you've got on on stream i think i'll go with this because rook f7 what would you play now Rip, mr reaper what would you play in this position as white yes i'll go with that I don't know though queen f8 is th is this really that bad what if queen f8 you see i was wondering myself that if rook f8 white has actually queen c7 here uh, which looks powerful and there's no easy way to defend g7 and avoid getting mated but in this position what what if queen f8 anyone see th this might not be the reason um, for things at minimum if we go back uh, unless anyone can see a complete win here in this position can anyone see a complete complete win for white I'm, I'm not entirely sure I can see one um, oh Queen c7 okay hold on a sec Queen C seven. Hmm. So, threatening this bishop. That does look strong, actually. It does look strong. Black's very passive. If we take take. In this position, what would happen? Sorry, there was a queen e8. Pardon me. Someone's saying about a queen e8. Let, let's go back. Let's go back. Oh, this is totally irrelevant. <laughs> Sorry sorry queen takes e8 check muppets <laughs> you see I, i'm a bit tired from last night and a club game last night i must but no one pointed that out until now <laughs> in my defense please try and keep 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 awake <laughs> to do this analysis no, no need for all this slow business just take on e8 here okay great great okay 
so that's that's answered that so uh, if, if black you know can't take on on d1 first um, because you can't move the Queen away from the Rook pardon me yeah let's, let's all try and keep awake from now on <laughs> so let's let's go back Bishop c2 Queen f6 let's go back into the game so Bishop b3 So with the queen attacking the rook, it's understandable to block that. Try and win a pawn now. Queen e2. So white's losing this pawn for a moment. And still getting this infiltration um, into black's 7th rank. With rook takes d4, queen takes d4 taking first on b6 and now playing rook d1 so white wants this seven franc queen c5 queen d2 very slowly a pawn down has sacrificed the whole pawn but got total access now uh, to the, the center okay in this position uh, it looks grim. If bishop c8, I think, you know, maybe we can just play queen d6. Uh, just, just, it looks pretty nasty, queen d6. Un unless there's another brilliant move I'm missing here. But um, it, it looks as though there's good compensation uh, for the pawn. Okay, in this position, actually, king g7 was played. Check, queen e7, check. And this wins the pawn back anyway. And this bishop's still a problem. So e5, queen takes b6. And black maybe doesn't like to play this move uh, for sort of a looks attacking aggressive, but it's causing more pawn weaknesses, the move f4. And it's that seeding of the e4 square is very interesting to see in, in respect of what happened later. That white is marking this e4 square now with f3. So this attack and this bishop doesn't look good and white's control of the d file looks good. So here, do you think that white is positionally uh, quite, got quite a big position here? Because black cannot contest that d file in this position. This bishop also has a very pleasant experience along this diagonal in this position. So anyway, black plays king h6, unusual looking. Okay, bishop c2, rook a8, a3, the queen is evicted from there, goes to d8. So some simplification, but white's pieces are still better quality, even in this simplified position. This bishop's very nice, it can go to e4, this rook's very nice, it can go to d7. g5 is going to make h7 worse. Okay, we see the move rook a5. And now h4, giving the king maybe an option of king h2 at some point. And you might think here, why can't black consider playing rook, rook c5? Would that be terrible to play rook c5? Uh, possi possibly maybe just bishop e4. If we imagine a check, king h2, this this is just not looking good, is it? This bishop, bishop pinning down that pawn. So maybe black's trying to play actively. And he plays actually, after h4, he plays c5. Okay. And now we see bishop d3. Okay, maybe wanting to play bishop c4, just to keep the pawn locked down. Rook a4, rook d7, bishop goes back to a8. And now bishop b5, and there's an unpleasant decision for black. This rook has only really got d4 and a5 here. Now if it goes to a5, uh, I think this could be extremely unpleasant. I suspect with a4 because this rook is now a prisoner 
How would black untangle in this position? Do you, do you know how black would untangle in this position? I'm having trouble with a bit of the chat on on stream tonight, actually, as well to see that the chat. I'm slightly disconcerting. I don't know what I've done with Windows, or whatever. Um, ah, okay, that's better. Pardon me. I was just being a muppet as usual. I think this is a big, big advantage here. Uh, you say C4. Someone's saying C4. You really think black can survive this? I don't know. Can we go for some sort of... Can we go for material? Can we just play rookie 7? How does black avoid loss of material now? So anyway, um, yeah. I don't think so. So black decided to play rook d4. Okay. We see rook take d4 brutally. And even this bishop ending is difficult, it seems. After e takes d4, okay. E takes d4 means, you know, if c takes d4, then we've got free reign with two connected past pawns, haven't we? So by playing it with... Uh, e takes d4 there's only one pass pawn and you might not think that's decisive here but have a look at this a4 king comes to g7 a5 and there's a winning maneuver on the cards white to play and win here with this a pawn how can white win with this a pawn you wonder what does white play in this position if i give you 20 seconds starting from now it looks as though it's a forced win having looked at the game briefly so white's playing win can anyone guess Last chance. Okay, someone on play chess has observed. Okay. Bishop d3. Just going to play bishop e4. Get rid of the blockade. And watch what happens. King d6, bishop e4. And the king, It even though it's in time for the pawn, black is forced to take here, creating another pass pawn. Whoa! Whoa! The black king cannot cope with this. This pawn's not going anywhere because of this king coming in. So if the king moves, we just play e5. It's all winning. It's over. Black has to go over here and we just play e5. A very profound little positional game, uh, this one, I think we've just evidenced. Let's have a look at it again. Very, very quiet, kind of polite positional play from white. And yet very effective right up to the end game. So this quick e4, not minding simplification, all white was content with was a dark square grip, a knight on d6 later, and even that was exchanged off for some other small advantage. Uh, the advantage being this d file and this hemmed in bishop. So playing on these small advantages. Uh, tactics came in as well that c5 was actually technically possible and this default tactic this queen eyeing e8 is very relevant as well as h7 in this uh, so here this this queen looking at that e8 is is, is amazing that white thinks he's winning material now by force but uh you know because he's he's guarded h7 and there's no there's no immediate tactical uh, win apparently and it looks as though this is a backward pawn on semi and foul so by rights as though black should should win that pawn um but there's still going to be compensation as black nabs that pawn and is punished on the default after takes and the punishment now is slow but sure on this default so very hard to calculate a move like queen d2 maybe 
when you've just won a pawn you don't really think you're going to carry on looking at this after queen d2 but the positional uh, pressure is is quite huge white gaining the pawn back anyway so still sitting on the position now dominating the d file marking out e4 very important later as we saw for this a pawn so and this rook just got in trouble so black's running out of pieces and the simplifications have not entirely helped if black um, is not capable bishop c4 maybe bishop g8 and rook here you know this pawn could be targeted so black's faced with some subtle threats as well to keep him busy and this transition this a pawn here just seems to be winning this blockader can be unblockaded leaving this running very fast sprinting a pawn so i think that was quite a neat game i hope you too you do too so let's have a look at another game of gwen jones <clears throat> now his opponent here um is a canadian i am um, panjwani uh, he was a 2009 canadian junior champion uh, let's have a look at this game so in this next game going playing white against I am Panjwani okay so we see d4 Panjwani is 2404 after knight f6 we see uh, Nimzo engine and now Kasparov's favorite move Queen c2 is played this is a popular way mainline maybe you consider Queen c2 here Knight c6 slightly unusual putting immediate pressure on d4 Knight f3 d6 okay Bishop d2 black castles a3 black takes on c3 anyway knowing he's not damaging the pawn structure but um, he's playing now for e5 it looks as though he's playing for e5 in any case but uh, he doesn't play e5 here plays queen e7 bishop e2 and again black's not interested in e5 here just plays a5 and okay uh, you might think should should white be concerned for example about a4 is that a problem should white waste time with b3 he doesn't actually he just plays castling uh castling move here okay and black does play a4 as though it's significant to mark out b3 is it is it really significant for black to mark out the b3 square white's got this d5 now and he's liberating the bishop a little bit on this diagonal like d8 and rook fd1 it's just supporting that pawn um, what would happen by the way if black took on d5 okay what would happen here is it a big problem what do we do take here or take here I think if we take here couldn't black just play knight takes d5 or is that punished if it takes here let's go with bishop f6 okay queen takes cd hang on we got a c7 problem problem c7 is dropping can't handle this surely or even even just supporting uh, with e4 if we take the problem is if we take there's knight d5 maybe it still looks good for white but maybe white just just plays uh, a move like rook here and this this pawn is is a bit vulnerable so okay okay so black just played knight d8 he doesn't want to open up this c file 
for that pawn to be back with pawn. So now we see uh, rook fd1, knight d7. Now the knight came away from h7, and that's probed with d3, creating a slight weakness because black responds with h6. And we see d takes e6, knight takes e6, and it looks as though black at least can look forward to a blockade on the c5 square. But knight d4, and look at this f5 square looks very dangerous against g7 here. Okay, what can black do here? Uses the c5 square with knight dc5. But, this is getting dangerous. White plays a technical move, check. And the king goes there. Why did the king go there? Is it such an onslaught? If we go here, knight f5 maybe. This looks like a problem for knight takes h6. If we go queen g5 in this position, maybe h4 or possibly f4. h4. That looks a bad problem. Queen h5. Is that the best move? What would happen here on king h8? Knight f5 must be the move. Queen g5. Maybe they're stronger than h4 here. Possibly f4. f4. You know what? I think we could even sack the g pawn. Uh, potentially for, for rook g1 is maybe it's too slow the knight can't move because of g7 here but if white's now threatening rook g1 oh there's queen f3 forget that scrap that <laughs> forget that oh dear does anyone see a bust for the black position in this position after queen g5 or should we just check the game continuation which is sort of similar <clears throat> Oh, pardon me, Rook D5, Alex Kidd. Rook D5, ah. That, that's really annoying for the Queen. So we're threatening Knight takes G7 at minimum. Knight takes D6, it's horrible. Forget that. So in the game, it was pretty horrible as well. We saw King F8, Knight F5, and the Queen went back to D8. Maybe because Queen G5, again, Rook D5 looks strong. But in this position, White's got a dominating position and rules out Queen G5 now completely. Just F4, ruling out the use of the Knight. But um, Black now plays G6. Okay. And tactically, is it look, does it look as though White's got loose pieces? For example, uh, knight takes h6. I think black might consider here queen h4. And these pieces look a bit uh, as though one of them's dropping off. But actually, uh, the way white plays this now uh, is, is a piece sacrifice in any case. White plays bishop takes g6. So one pawn for the piece. Two pawns for the piece. Uh, uh, uh. So two pawns for the piece. <laughs> Sorry, um, king e7 is played. Now what if queen h4 in this position? What would white play here? Well, it looks actually just queen takes g6 is entirely crushing, threatening queen f7. And if rook e7, there's queen g8, mate. So it looks completely crushing uh, visually, this position. So forget queen h4. Black actually plays king e7. And we see queen takes g6 anyway with with that huge threat of mate. Um, so the end is not too far away, you might think. Rook f8, and we see f5. So for the piece, this is a bit towel-like now, this piece sacrifice. Queen e8, f6 is played, king d7, 
f7 this pawn is a menace protected by the knight queen e7 bishop f6 as though the queen's been checkmated the queen hasn't got any squares but black plays a resourceful move nevertheless it might not be enough black plays knight f4 to release the queen by attacking Gwen's queen okay but white is at least getting material the piece back with advantage just plays check queen e6 and just simply takes from f4 a lot of material up and winning even more material now after knight e4 white plays bishop g7 and here black's had enough demolition job this game black resigned here so some problems for black um white's playing very nice chess Gwen's playing very nice chess it seems so this seems quite a memorable game against a knight c6 nimzo indian where white gains the small advantage of this dark squared bishop was able to play later d5 and cause all sorts of havoc along this diagonal and notable perhaps is the f5 square usage where did black actually weaken f5 in this game so severely well i think it was when we saw d takes e6 that black didn't take with the pawn but with a piece that f5 was actually weakened in this game uh, so we saw after the initial weaknesses on the light squares uh, this makes a knight coming to f5 more effective because it rules out usually g6 if you play h6 a knight on f5 is more effective as a general rule uh, now here if black had taken with the pawn what would be the punishment in this position black didn't take with the pawn in the game um, perhaps just check you know and then queen g6 threatening queen takes h6 is is pretty dangerous possibly if knight f8 queen takes h6 knight takes h7 knight g5 no we just take queen g5 no let's go back let's go back here i hope we're all agreed on bishop h7 check or is there something stronger is there bishop g6 do we agree bishop h7 check first move in this position what about we can't play knight h4 yet what do we play here queen g6 actually that's possible hold on a sec again this eyeing of e8 is significant surely knight f8 we've got then we got bishop g7 here queen takes g7 queen takes e8 winning material we're just the exchange up doesn't bishop takes g7 do the job in this position to distract the queen from e8 i would say it does the job myself it seems to so big frets for black if knight f6 again bishop f6 we can't take with the queen because queen e8 if we take with the pawn this bishop's in danger I'm not convinced again <laughs> oh dear does white really play rook d4 in this position to swing the rook across knowing the queen at the moment can't take here do we get time for rook, rook h4 possibly okay so as it turned out i mean it looked terrible as it turned out because by black taking with the knight this f5 square became vulnerable and okay so the next question why didn't black like take on d4 here
maybe you know he wanted this c5 square maybe possibly ed and we can use this e file and um, you know white's going to play d5 and it's maybe that's not how black really liked the position <clears throat> Okay, so uh, knight takes e6, and we saw this um, this terrible knight being allowed to come to f5 in this position, and then it was just after this peace sack. Now it was a slaughter. This f pawn ingen ingeniously coming to f7 as well. This peace sack, and this this queen, this pawn coming to f7, and it's just it's just overloading black's defensive resources so that was quite an interesting game as well okay so let's have a look at another game so against another british grandmaster keith arkell this time uh playing white gwen jones played d4 again and we saw uh c4 c5 and a check benoni closing up the position Okay, e4 from white. Now g6. Very closed position. Black's not going to have too much pressure on the queen side usually. With the sense of so closed, this next idea seems very interesting. h3. Okay, knight f3. And black, does black dare castle? Black did dare castle. And this next move from white you might find a little bit surprising and possibly a little bit audacious can you guess what white played in this position if i give you 20 seconds sorry please don't look at the game score sheet if you're on play chess please go to the openings book tab or another tab so with the center closed we can afford more luxuries perhaps with our long-term uh, attacks Okay, so white played <laughs> g4. It does provide a sort of traditional clamp on f5 later, saying, does black really want to play f5 psychologically? Um, if it's a sort of king's engine, black would be annoyed not being able to play f5 sometimes. King h8 is played. Bishop e3. Knight g8. Bishop d3. And look at this bind on this f5 square and it could be even reinforced further if white wants knight e7 and rook g1 saying to black really really are you seriously going to play f5 i'll have this open file to play with i'm going to just take on f5 and work with that g file black doesn't play f5 here plays knight d7 so white intensifies a little bit of the pressure providing the option of bishop h6 so black's really kind of in a restricted uh, position. A4, putting a bind on the queen side against any B5. So are you really going to try for B5 here? So black maybe is asking uh, a question here. How, how are you exactly going to break through? Okay, what, what is white's breakthrough plan really? Well, interestingly, this next move, White seems to have spent time creating this battery and blocks his own battery with G5. The pawn is now blocking this. And pa perhaps we have H4, H5 on the cards and just peel open the H file. Black now plays F5 to try and get some play here. But now another point of, of this g5, white can take en passant. Okay. And it still looks like a pleasant position. Uh, this pawn is, is loose at the moment, but does that matter? Well, knight g5 technically does protect the pawn, but I think there's other ideas behind knight g5. Knight coming into e6 sometime. Knight h5 is played. And black is trying to use this f4 square. That's one thing he has got going, this f4 square. Because if white ever takes, this bishop will be liberated on this diagonal. If black can ever get in, e takes f4. 
So we see bishop e2 and then knight f4. And this pawn again is attacked and it's again def defended, but that's not the main point. Surely a bishop g4. Okay. A very tactical move from Keith now. Knight f5, hitting uh, this knight. Okay, white takes on f5, queen takes g5, but now white's got that e4 square, uses it. Looks like a nice knight for the moment, attacking the queen. Okay, white takes on g4, g6 rather, pardon me. Queen takes g6. And now just f3, protecting that knight. And uh, this bishop is, is protecting the rook now, which means bishop takes c8 is threatened, attacking the queen. The queen gets out of the firing line with queen h6. And white castles queen side now. Positionally, like with other Gwen Jones games, uh, it seems black's count play is not too much at all. It seems very comfortable positions where you wouldn't be that terrified to play with the white pieces here, would you? Has black got significant counterplay? The king seems quite cosy here. Black's pawn's kind of committed. Okay, bishop f5 is played. White takes off that bishop and plays rook g3. So preparing maybe just to use that g-file, put pressure on the g-file, rook d8. Uh, because the queen is is going to be overloaded, it seems, because this knight's always hitting d6. Can the queen be distracted away from g7? So this this is a passive setup, defending d6 and g7. Rook d7. Okay, king b1. And black now targets more seriously this h pawn with rook h5. King a2 is played. So what's going on here? Is this a poisoned pawn? Is this pawn actually is this pawn actually takeable here? Black played uh, b6. Uh, if if we do take this pawn here, what is the actual punishment? Does anyone know? Is there a clear cut punishment, first of all? If I give you 20 seconds to have a look at this position, which might have occurred. So, is there a clear cut punishment? 20 seconds starting from now. Anyone? Okay, someone said Lee, Lee Chess 78. Bishop takes f4 is strong. Let's prove that. Is that the case, really? It is a forcing move. Is bishop takes f4 really strong here? Okay, we can't take with the queens, we lose the rook. We take with this, and haven't we just liberated the bishop? So you better know what you're doing. You just liberate this bishop. So you're saying in this position. Rook takes. Then knight g5. And it looks as though this knight's going to install itself on e6, if nothing else. It, it looks pretty strong. Um, it looks pretty dominating. Black's again devoid of, of counterplay. Not knight g5. Anything stronger than knight g5? Queen takes f4, of course. It looks strong as well. 
There's no time to use this diagonal, is there? Um, H2 is covered, G2 is covered. Uh, we've got numerous threats. We've got a threat of knight takes d6. There's all sorts of threats. Not too dissimilar to the game. Uh, let's see, in the game, we see b6. Okay, queen c2. Okay. So, it's, it's even, uh, okay, rook h4. And this this is amazing stuff now, uh, believe it or not. This next move is is a little bit of a shocker. Um, very resourceful, and not entirely evident from the logic of previous play. Um, can you guess what White played here? If I give you twenty seconds, starting from now. Because all the attention seems to be on the G file, this night on D6, and not much else. So this next move might be very, very hard for you to discover. Can, can you guess what white plays in this position? Uh, if I give you 20 seconds. Black seems to be having a good time with his dark square blockades on F4 and H4 not wanting to win material, just sitting on the dark squares, trying to create an entrenched uh, fortress on the dark squares. But it's actually a kind of light square attack, which might be the Achilles heel of the black position. How can white inflict a light square attack here? Anyone? The coziness of Black's position is interrupted. The apparent coziness. With a staggering move, to be honest, I find it quite staggering that White considered this A5. 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 After all this, to play A5. It looks as though Queen A4, and there's an access route here. Potentially. How would the queen easily defend against queen a4? It's, this is really dangerous, surely. Uh, if we imagine this position, let's just imagine taking queen a4. Black looks to be a little bit overloaded. Maybe even here, knight takes d6. We've got overloading symptoms. We can take here. And if queen, if rook takes, we can play check. So it looks like there's overloading symptoms based on trying to defend light squares all of a sudden, which is not what black's position was designed for here. It was all about dark square blockades. So black actually plays b5. which looks very interesting dynamic as well. C takes B5 and Black now loses patience uh, sitting on the dark squares because now it's faced with these new uh, assets being thrown on the queen side. So Black plays Rook takes H3. Okay, so here we enter a forcing sequence stage. Rook takes H3, forcing move, Queen takes H3, Knight G5, forcing move, attacking the queen, eyeing of course h7 as well queen h5 another forcing move queen f5 attacking the rook so that's another way to attack the rook the light square attack is pretty ferocious here all of black's pawns on dark squares you might expect that sort of punishment that it's actually the light squares which is the achilles hill of, of black's position uh, we see rook e7 and now taking off that that knight as though teasing the bishop is given some some light on this diagonal but uh, here another forcing move which is entirely uh, crushing is played in this position in the final move I wonder if you can guess it if I give you 20 seconds starting from now
Anyone? You want to make Queen C8 more effective. That's a clue. Someone's mentioned Queen C8. And Queen C8, you just play Rook E8. The, the Queen's protecting E8. So how can you overload Queen for Queen C8 to be played more effective? If I give you that as the question, make Queen C8 more effective. What tactic would you use to make Queen C8 more effective? Okay, some, someone's got it. Well done, chess chief. Rook h1. Crush. Yeah, otherwise, um, it's all dropping off here. So, black resigned. If queen takes, we play check. And it's mating, isn't it? It's, it's technical. This wasn't the ingenious bit of the game, this forcing sequence. I think the ingenious bit of the game was the light square strategy all of a sudden. And I think the most ingenious move, as far as I'm concerned, is in this position where black seems to be quite safe to play the move a5 and all of a sudden introduce a lot of light square pressure. So this queen is attacking on both sides of the board all of a sudden. Quite interesting. Okay. Uh, we could could just quickly just look at that game overview and summary um so the check benoni was profoundly defeated here on the light squares um the light squares being weakened in black's position we, we know that they're fundamentally weakened uh, interesting access paths here being demonstrated Uh, particularly this a5 <clears throat> and now for a forcing sequence which I don't know how many of you think is ingenious but it, this is just technical really to see these forcing moves Queen f5 and this this final rook h1 is after after Bishop takes f4 is an absolute crusher okay so let's have a look at um, one uh, last game uh, another decisive nice uh, game why didn't I play I've never played in Hastings I if my if I didn't have a knee injury I would have played in London classic but I had a knee injury I, I would have loved to have played in London chess classic uh, and I'm hoping to make <laughs> sure if there's not other fide but no I've never played in Hastings I don't know how many of you have played in the Hastings Congress uh, but it, it's not my time of the year uh, to be going to Hastings it's not it doesn't really to my particular fancy um, but um, okay so let's uh, flip the board here uh, so Gwen Jones was um, playing black and um, we see a very very interesting uh, opening which Gwen uses as black which maybe so many of you may have thrown away when you were a kid uh, because of getting mated down the H file. And the name of that particular variation of the Sicilian is called the Sicilian Dragon. So from a weapon of choice which may maybe um, you got fed up, you did try the dragon at some point and you gave it up, it seems Gwen is really taking this opening seriously. So his opponent here is, is a Grandmaster, 2521 Grandmaster, Vocaturo. Uh, there's a lot of counterplay in the Sicilian Dragon. It can be taken extremely seriously. Uh, Vocaturo, for those that don't know, I've got some notes here uh, <clears throat> from ChessGames.com. Um, he was the World Under-18 Champion in 2006, runner-up in the in the fourth um, ACC Open in 2008, third in the Chorus Group C in 2010, third in Thessalonic Open Greece in 2010, winner of the Open um, Cita de Balaga in Spain. 2010 he's won a few tournaments in his time okay so we see here the dragon being really tested with seemingly very very sharp uh, this this is it you know this is this is the test the Queen d2 test so white castling Queen side now Gwen plays a very quick 
d5 here very very quick none he's not messing around with perhaps what we call you know those traditional plans i seem to remember the dragon like this and play knight c4 and but no d5 is really popular now so and we see uh, a very aggressive gambit emerge because white takes on c6 takes on d5 and i i thought it was really popular I'd, i'm not really up on the dragon to play um in fact even before this because black's getting uh this this c file blocked by his own pawn i thought the move was bishop d4 myself but white's playing more ambitiously uh to win a pawn because if, if you encourage e5 blocking in this bishop bishop c5 but i don't really want to get into the theory of this um because i don't know much fear of the dragon so that's that's a pretty dangerous thing to be me getting into so knight takes c6 we see this this line being chosen anyway well white's winning this pawn okay and when i looked at this on the stream i thought this is really really dangerous isn't it uh that black is playing queen c7 here off offering the rook it's all theory because if it takes uh we play bishop f5 i assume threatening mate and the queen and so black's got great chances there uh so in this position white plays queen c5 and it looks like a line which you know maybe it was prepared with an engine or something maybe engines like playing this with white or something they're not too scared of black's resources but for me i'd be scared of black's resources here okay the queen is also attacking e7 and you want to keep this kind of attack going down the b file so this next move looks quite interesting and logical at the same time queen b7 okay so threatening b2 that's shielded bishop f5 but really really would you like to play the white pieces in this position hands up who would really want to play the white pieces here if i give you 20 seconds don't you think black has got easy play against the white king i don't want to bias your opinions of the position but especially if it was blitz chess this would be pretty horrific to try and play wouldn't it what do you think dangerous okay let's carry on queen a3 okay black's able to just build up pressure bishop a6 another technical looking move as though this came from computer analysis or something uh queen c6 or maybe it's just just mainline theory okay bishop d3 but black accepts interestingly doubled pawns with rook fc8 uh, this pawn is going to get aggressive in this game which is interesting in its own right bishop takes f5 g takes so this pawn is potentially uh, a squasher with f4 at some point for this bishop to be pushed back rook d3 we see e5 so more aggressive than the pawn being on g6 rook hd1 bishop f8 queen a5 another technical move okay attacking e5 protected with rook b5 queen a4 squashing with f4 a little bit of space okay doesn't really want to walk into a massive pin looks it looks ridiculous that sort of thing to take on a7 bishop g1 but now the pawn is, is moved anyway okay so black has pressure queen e6 attacking a2 the king goes to protect that rook c4 queen e2 rook a4 again attacking a2 and now more radical defenses are needed in this position <laughs> white's not content with b3 here uh, white goes all the way with b4 it just looks so dangerous uh this position queen c4 
Queen D2, when is the punishment going to come? Uh, first safeguarding the king against maybe the back row, the, so the bishop's not likely to be pinned. Rook D8, without pinning the bishop. And now the punishment. Okay, Rook A takes B4 check. It seems quite logical. Um, <clears throat> so tactically, I mean, well, white played king a1. If white does take the rook, let's ask that obvious question. Bishop takes b4 looks strong. It, well, it looks as though this is going to be a massacre, you know, whatever happens. So anyway, so white, white's idea was, was king a1. And black is 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 now this this maybe looks initially slightly controversial to play rook b2 to give up both rooks for the queen, but that's what is played rook b2. So we have here a situation where is really that the coordination of the rooks going to be as good as the queen or better. So two rooks for the queen scenario. The thing is, this pawn is also quite aggressive. Like this pawn went here, this pawn wants to go here. These pawns are played very, very aggressively by black. A5. Okay, check. Bishop A3, threatening mate on the spot. Queen C4, threatening the A2 pawn. That's shielded. Bishop F8. Okay, this pawn really wants to go to A4. King D2, A4. And now the bishop goes back, Rook C2. King g6, taking things slowly. Why does the king want to go to g6, you might ask? Okay, on the sixth row, well, the bishop's covering d6 anyway, of course, but black maybe wants to get in like this at some point. g3 takes f5. Pass pawn on the way. And this pawn on e4 will guard d3. Look at White's defensive task here. It seems quite hard. Is it hard? E4 takes takes rook d7 without being checked. So that justifies the king being on g6. No time wasted answering checks. Queen b5 hitting the rook. And maybe, you know, over here would be fun as well. Okay, what to do about the rook? The rook goes back. Unfortunately, black in this position can be a little bit pedantic now. It doesn't have to go for the white king. It can be pedantic from a materialistic point of view. So guess what black plays in this position? If I give you 20 seconds starting from now. Anyone? It's material tactic, material tactic, material winning tactic. Bishop c5, this bishop's loose. Skewer. Or is it? Reverse skewer. <laughs> um, not really a skewer. The more valuable piece is here, not behind it. But um, okay, c4. And white can just win material with queen b4 check but even worse he goes for the king uh, with queen b1 now and it's vicious white just wants to lose the exchange but Gwen's not having just the exchange he's having white's king with queen b4 check pardon me bishop b4 check so now if rook c3 queen b2 well actually white resigned here because if king e2 as well, then there's queen e1. And look at this pawn. Pretty useful to have that pawn on e4 here as an extra attacking resource. End of game. So the Sicilian dragon's back in business, it seems. If Gwen can really smash grit GMs with it in the Hastings. Back in business. It's, it's a way of fighting 
you just have to be dynamic. That's the usual story. So dynamic pawn sacrifice, loads of pressure. Dynamic use of the g6 pawn, which is usually just on g6, is now helping to provide another critical attacking resource in the form of a pawn on e4 later. Because uh, we see now f5 and e4 on the cards uh, pretty soon. So just skimming through here. Uh, so we see this f5 and e4 gives much more oomph to black's attack. Coordinating the rooks is always going to be troublesome. Um, even more so here than usual. Okay, so yeah. Um, is there any other game to look at that I had on the cards? Um, I know, I think um, that's enough. And it's been over an hour, so I hope you've enjoyed this session. Okay, hope you got something out of it. See you next week. Okay, good luck in your chess. Happy New Year again. Okay, thanks very much. I, I don't know about the opening theory, to be honest. It's so sharp, Sicilian Dragon. Um, regards to where, if he went wrong in the opening. Okay, cheers.